Hi everyone and welcome back to the next lecture of the Advanced Deep Learning for Computer Vision. Today we are going to talk about semi-supervised learning. And maybe we have start by motivating this, like what is semi-supervised learning and what, why do we need it? Like so far in this course and also in the previous course, like introduction to deep learning, most of the problem that were addressed dealt with a setting when you have like training data that is labeled. So you have like a data set that someone has done it for you and the data set has like images because you're doing like a computer vision course and also labels for those images. Now the tasks, the tasks that we have uh, discussed, they could be like very different from each other. For example, we did like similarity learning when you try to find the most similar images in a data set or we did like a graph neural networks, we did transformers or in like you might imagine, for example, to do segmentation, tracking, detection, all these things, but the setting stays the same. So you have like an image and then you have the label that corresponds to that image. For example, in classification, the label would be like just the label of the image of like what class like the image belongs. While for example, in segmentation, the labels would be like what class does every, does every pixel in the image belongs to. Now, one question might be addressed. What happens if we have like the same data set, but we don't have labels? Or maybe we have labels just for a few images in the entire data set. And this might sound academical, but it's actually something that happens in practice, like in real world, because there are like, it's probably easy to create a data set. You could just crawl the internet and get like all the data that you need there. But it's very time consuming to label every image in the data set. For example, let's say you want to improve classification and maybe you download from internet 1 billion images. Labeling 1 billion images, on the other hand, would be very hard and expensive. So what we want to show today is to show that it's actually possible to be able to learn, to actually properly learn, even if you have like a data set which for most part is unlabeled and it has like uh, only some labels there. So that's what I mentioned. And then uh, the second part is that maybe we don't have any label at all, but we have some labeling budget. For example, we have X dollars or X euros for which we can pay people to label images. And the question is, how do we label the most interesting image, images in the data set such that the performance of your networks get maximized? And these two approaches are kind of related to each other and we are going to cover on these two classes. So today we are going to deal with semi-supervised learning. So with having a data set that has only some images labeled and then you want to somehow use the unlabeled part of the data set also. While in the next class we are going to deal with active learning, which is how to find the most interesting images in the data set and label them in such a way that the entire performance of the networks maximize so the network improves better. So let's start today with semi-supervised learning. And what is semi-supervised learning? So again, like the setting that I mentioned, you have like a data set, very big data set, and someone has given like some labels for you, maybe like 1% of the images are labeled or maybe 10%, so it doesn't matter. And then here you have like a lot of unlabeled data. And the entire idea of semi-supervised learning is that you somehow use your model that you are training on the labeled data to somehow infer something for the unlabeled data. Now, how does this inference happen? Like, how does the model uh, is able to use the unlabeled data? That depends on your algorithm, but for most part, it's some type of label propagation. So you want the labels that are on the labeled data to help you a bit on to being able to use the unlabeled data. And uh, the nice thing is that for most part, you use the same network. So you use a network that you are training with the labeled data and also feeding to it unlabeled data. And then the network is able to either infer the data, the labels for the unlabeled data or find some other relation between them to actually use the unlabeled data to train the same network. Now, there are different families of approaches that do semi-supervised learning. And perhaps the most traditional one is the transductive methods. 
Transactive methods are built in the idea that similar objects should have the same classes to each other and they should have different classes to images that are not similar to them. So this is more or less the traditional semi-supervised learning approach that has been working for more than 20 years now. And uh, it, was, it goes under different names, so it probably started with uh, a method that it's known as label propagation, and then it has been changed to like more sophisticated methods like label smoothing or label harmonization or many, many other transactive methods. What is interesting is that transductive methods were not developed for neural networks. They were de developed for any type of data. So you could have like feature based data and then you are able to use them. And because they were developed like 20 years ago, back then neural networks were not big. So most of the experiments on those papers were not done in neural networks at all, but they were done in other types of uh, classifiers or actually they uh, made their own classifier that it's able to somehow uh, like transduct the label from the labels from the images that are labeled to those that are not are not labeled and for most part like all these methods kind of work in some idea that you build a graph of similarity between images or actually between objects because you might have like just uh, objects that are represented by feature data so not images at all and uh, so somehow you create the relation like which are which images are similar to each other maybe use some exponential kernel to do so and then you try to re refer the labels from uh, the image from the object that don't that have labels to those that don't have labels on deep learning related to them but not exactly the same is uh, are like uh, graph convolutional neural network which were reincarnated by Kipf and Welling and in some way they could be considered as transductive methods. So we are going to explain them in this lecture but only briefly because mostly they worked only with graphs and for some part you have like to train on the same graph that as you have to test it. We are going to use today like to spend most of the lecture in two other approaches which have been developed for uh, have been developed for deep learning and are more recent. So the first one is like pseudo labeling and they work with a very, very simple idea. So you get like, you train a network in the label data and then you feed unlabeled data to the network. Now, if the network is confident for the unlabeled data, and by that we mean that on like, if you take the softmax distribution that the network predicts, you go to the highest value of it. And if that highest value is above some threshold, then you just pseudo label that, uh, that image. For example, you give like an image and then your network is going to predict different probabilities for different class. For example, it might say that this image is, I don't know, 0 0.1 or like 10% cat, 90% dog and 0% cow, let's say. Now you go to the highest uh, value here. In this case, it was dog 90%. And then you, you see if this value is above some threshold. For example, you have put your threshold at 80%. Now, because 90 is like bigger than 80, then you just consider that this image actually belongs to the class dog, despite that you're not sure that this is the case. And then you use this image as it was a labeled image. So because the label is not really done by a by a human, but it's done by the neural network. That's why we call it pseudo label. And it's a very, very simple idea that could be implemented in like 10 lines of code, but works very, very good. And with many extensions that have been developed during the years, it works even better. Now relate to pseudo labeling is another simple idea that is called consistency-based SSL, consistency-based semi-supervised learning. Now, the main idea here is that you get an image and then maybe you make some augmentation to it, for example, a rotation or a translation, or maybe you just change a bit the colors to it. And then you feed both the original image and the augmented version of it, so the version that you changed, to the neural network. And then you define the loss in such a way as to try to measure the difference between these two images. For example, you can uh, measure the L2 loss between the features of the original image to the uh, augmented image, so you feed like both to the net neural network, you get the features on the last layer of the neural network, and then you just do the L2 norm there. 
or maybe you could uh, just see like that they uh, like the for example KL uh, callback lidar divergence between the two distributions that the network gives to you and then you just try to minimize this loss so in, in this way what you're trying to make the neural network learn is that these two images should be like should give the same prediction because they are like the same image it's just that we have changed a bit one image and like pseudo labeling despite that it works in this such a simple idea it is very effective and it gives really good results so mathematically it could be shown that they are actually they, are, they have connection like pseudo labeling with, with consistency based ssl with each other so i call that they are like the young yin yang to each other and uh, it could also be shown that they are instances of entropy minimization so with this uh, after I described like in uh, main idea, like the three main families of semi-supervised learning, let's start with uh, transductive methods and let's go deeper to each of them. So you have already seen a bit about graph neural networks and the idea right there is that you have like a graph which has like some nodes and some edges and nodes could be like, for example, in your case, images, while edges could be the relation between images. And like during the graph that was uh, uh, Professor Lalteche like uh, gave a lecture on them, like you could uh, during the course, so uh, you want to learn to somehow make both the nodes, like the description for the nodes better and that of the for the edges better. And for example, for the node, you have like you have like node HI, and then you have all of its neighbors of it. So you want to somehow use your neural network to give like a better encoding of this, like to use the relation of the neighbors to make a better description of the node. Similarly, you have also for edges. Now, this can be done like in similar in uh, different ways. For example, the, probably the most famous one is that of convolutional based CNNs here. And uh, for example, let's say for node HI, we want to update it. So we have like a matrix of weights that gets multiplied with the node HI. And then we have another matrix of weights W1 that gets multiplied with all the neighbors of the node HI. So after we uh, do this, like with all the neighbors, we could have like a summation here or maybe the average, like some operator that makes like uh, this information more compact then we add with the self information of the node agi and then we feed this to uh, like some non-linearity function so what's important here is that you have like like in neural networks normal neural network you have like one matrix of weights here you have like typically two matrices of weights one for the node itself like in this case w0 and one for the neighbors of the node now there are other ways, for example, relational graph CNNs and so other. So we're not going to go into them, but we're going just to sh show how we can extend this idea of graph neural networks to actually do semi-supervised learning. So again, like we have here like a graph as an input and we have like some of the edges between the nodes in the graph that uh, someone has labeled, but not all of them. Now we feed this graph to our graph neural networks and it's going like to have maybe like uh, hidden layers when it does all the relations some non-activation then another hidden layer and then we have like the output so which is going to give like the graph now our goal is to predict edges from pair of node embeddings so as i said someone has given like has labeled part of the graph but it has not been able to label all of the no all the edges between the nodes. So what we want to show somehow is like how can we use like this graph to actually learn for all of the missing edges that are not in the graph. And the idea is pretty simple. So maybe you train like with contrastive loss. So you just know like for all of these uh, edges that someone has given to you, you could. Uh, consider these as labels and then you train like with a contrastive loss to for example learn like this uh, edge like the red edge here that should have been here now how you do so you typically like sample some of the some of the edges that uh, are labeled and then you also sample some of the like you do some negative sampling because most of the graph is 
most of the nodes are not connected, so you just uh, get some of them and then you make the network to actually try to learn like where it should be an edge and where it should not be an edge. And after you do like the training, then in inference, you just apply this and then you learn like where should be like these missing edges. Again, this method is mostly based for graphs and why graphs are very useful. We are going to spend like our lecture mostly on other types of data that uh, are not graphs at all and that are a bit probably easier to also do them than using graph neural networks. But this was more or less just to give like as a main intuition how you do this. So you have like a graph and then you're trying to learn the missing edges that are not there. And the way it, it is, this is like in the notion of similarity. So you make like, you make your graph neural network to predict like these edges that are in the graph. So you could have like maybe as an autoencoder here that tries to learn all of these edges. And then you do like some contrastive loss to also be able to deal with uh, parts of the graph that you haven't had. And uh, I just want to show the video. So they give like in the paper, like how this would work. So maybe I repeat it again. So you have like there, like the graph. And then when you apply it, this uh, graph CNN, like after a few iteration, you see like how everything is kind of almost like clustered on different parts of the embedding space. So you see how there. <laughs> For like to see it more uh, in more details, I would recommend to read the papers of uh, Kip Van Valing that was in the references. Now, uh, I want to just say that this, it has like, it's a bit similar in spirit to old methods. And if you actually would like to check the old methods, you could go maybe and check these references. So it's sort of like with uh, label propagation from paper of Zhu and Garamani. Then uh, this was kind of improved to something that it's known as uh, label spreading and then label harmonization. And then it has been also used more recently with a method that actually probably work a bit better like graph transduction game. If you go in sklearn and you want actually to use these methods in practice, if you go in semi-supervised learning, actually the first two methods like label propagation and label spreading have very nice and easy to use implementation. So if you have like ever like, for example, you have like some features that have only some of them are labeled, one easiest way to actually be able to use this data set would be to use one of these two methods like label propagation and label spreading that can be found into very nice implementation in sklearn. With this intro gone, let's go more into deep learning works. And we continue here with the pseudo labeling family of, uh, of uh, paradigms. So I'm going to start like with this paper that was uh, in 2013, like ICML workshop. It was at the very beginning of the new era of neural networks, so just when deep learning started. And I already explained the idea, like, like the main intuition of the idea is to use the network to make predictions for the unlabeled data. And if those predictions are very confident, then you pseudo label those images and then you use them as if they were labeled data. So the first step here would be like you have a network and you have like some labeled data, you feed them to the network until the network is trained to such a degree that it is relatively reliable. Then you have the unlabeled data and then you feed them to the network. And then you just uh, get like the prediction of the network, the softmax distribution of the network. And then you just see if the highest value in the softmax distribution is like uh, greater than some threshold. And if it is, then you say that, yeah, then this image is like a labeled image and then it has this class. Otherwise you just don't consider it as labeled. And then the third step is you combine, like you add like this uh, data that you just, that the network just labeled for you. And then you use them as if they were like labeled data. So here, let's go in the equation here. So here we have uh, like, images and their ground truth. And this is like this part is the labeled part of the loss, so labeled loss. And then you just do, for example, cross entropy here on like if you would have done normally if you trained a network only in labeled data. 
This part, it's very, very similar. In fact, it's if you check carefully, it's almost the same. So instead of having like labeled images, we have like unlabeled images. And instead of having labels, we have pseudo labels. And then you still do cross entropy here. So this alpha is just like some uh, scaling parameter, like hyperparameter to see how much do you want to weight the pseudo labels because maybe because you're not completely sure that the pseudo labels are correct. In fact, some of them are not going to be correct. Maybe you want to weight it a bit less than the weight for the real labels. And more or less, this is the idea. So very, very simple. Use the network to make prediction on the unlabeled part of the data. If those predictions are higher than some, uh, or confidence, or they are like higher than some threshold, then use those predictions as pseudo labels. And then you train the network in both the labeled and the unlabeled part. Like for the labeled part, you use labels. For the unlabeled part, if you have pseudo labels, you use. If you don't have pseudo labels, you just wait until maybe this image is going to be pseudo labeled because you could then do like this iteratively or you could do at the same time, feed some images that are labeled, feed some images that are unlabeled, but that, that help pseudo labels. And then after some uh, training steps, you see like for the other images, have they become more confident? In case they have become more confident than some threshold, then you add new pseudo labels. Otherwise, you just continue this iterative process. Now, one question might be like, why does this work? And I'm just going to give like a tiny bit of uh, math intuition. But the idea is that it's uh, related to something that we call entropy minimization. And the idea is that entropy minimization is to minimize the conditional entropy of class probabilities for unlabeled data. So what you're actually trying to do with this uh, pseudo labeling that I described here is you're trying to minimize the conditional entropy of the probabilities for this data that uh, it's unlabeled. So in other words, you're trying to make these uh, unlabeled data to give predictions that are like uh, very confident. And then how can this be done statistically is like to, you could just use the map estimate. In fact, that would uh, be the maximizer of the posterior distribution as given in the equation here. Again, I'm not going to give like too much math into this. I just want to show you like the brief idea of the math behind pseudo labeling. But in case you're more interested to actually see like uh, how this would work, I would recommend to read this paper from uh, Dong Hyun Lee, which is like uh, the seminal reference on pseudo labeling. But we are in 2021 and this paper was 2013, so eight years ago, why we are why we are explaining old stuff. And the idea is that there have been many recent methods that have been working over this paper and improving it to actually make neural modern neural networks like deep neural networks work really well. And such a methods, maybe the most famous one is the noisy noisy students, so it's called like uh, this paper from Xi et al. Cell training with noisy students improves image net classification. And the idea here is very similar to the original pseudo label paper. Again, you have like labeled data and unlabeled data, but, but uh, this paper, which is actually from Google Brain, they go a bit extreme. So for labeled data, they say, yeah, we have like the image net data set. Let's not pretend that we don't have it. And like many methods, what would they do is, for example, artificially remove some of the labels and then, for example, just use 10% of the labels. But no, this guy, they said, yeah, we have ImageNet. Someone has labeled it for us like a long time ago. It has like almost 1.5 million images and they are all labeled. So we have it. But we also have, because we are Google, we have this JFT data set with 300 million images. And this data set is actually not labeled at all. So now you see like the, how do they go to the extreme? Like they are using now 300 million images to train the network, but only 1.4 million of them are labeled. So like around 0.3% of the data set is labeled. And now what do they do? Like how do they uh, work? Like uh, the intuition is given like in this figure here, you train the network, like the teacher model, which they call, you train them like a model into ImageNet data set. And then you use the same model to infer, like to predict labels for the images in JFT. 
Now, if those uh, predictions are like more confident or like confident, so like the highest value is above some threshold, then you train another network into both the labeled data and the unlabeled data at the same time. And for the unlabeled data, it uses these predictions. And then you do this into a few steps. Now let's go a bit for each step, like for of them, let's go a bit more into details. So I just put here the algorithm that can scare it. I'm going to go over every step of it. So we have like labeled images and unlabeled images. And as we have denoted here, like for example, the first image is like X1 and it has a label Y1. Then we have like the second image, which has like X2 with label Y2. And in case of ImageNet here, it would be like X1 million something and Y1 million something. And then we have also a lot of unlabeled images, so x1 tilde, x2 tilde, x300 million tilde. Now we have like a teacher model which minimizes the cross entropy loss on labeled images. So, on other words, like in plain English, this means you train a network in ImageNet dataset because they are using ImageNet dataset as the uh, teacher, as the labeled images. So you train the teacher into ImageNet dataset. And here is just like, how do you train this? By using cross entropy loss, like people doing classification. Then they use this network, this teacher, to actually make prediction on the unlabeled images. So use the teacher network to make prediction in JFT dataset. And now the third step, which is actually the most interesting one, is that you train your new network, like the student, into JFT dataset together with ImageNet using the pseudo labels that you got here as they were real labels. But they actually do a very interesting modification, which makes results get much better. When you're training the student, they don't use the original images but they make modification to these images. For example, you, you could do like some uh, translation, rotation, or actually as they do in this paper, they do strong augmentation. So they use a library that does massive augmentation in an image. For example, it changes the colors. It, at the same time, it might uh, do some rotation. It might do some scaling. It might do some uh, random patching there. And they show that this is actually important because you have like uh, the label for the original image, but now you're feeding to the network the corrupted image and you're still trying to use that label that you did. And then they repeat this uh, process several times. So at the end of the training, when you have trained the student, then you make you promote the student to a teacher and then you use that uh, old student or the new teacher to make new predictions in the JFT dataset. And then in these new predictions, you train the new student. So they show that you could do this several times already to actually improve the results even more. Now, what is this noise in the noisy student that I mentioned? So what they show is that while you train the teacher with the clean images, and you make predictions in the clean images, you train the student with augmented images. And as I mentioned, like this could be like, the augmented images could be as simple as just doing translations, or they could be something more complicated. And in this paper, they use more complicated things, which they uh, uh, divide into two categories, so input noise and model noise. Now for the input noise, it's just like changing the image. And as I said, they use some heavy augmentation, strong augmentation to really change the image significantly. And they also show that you could use uh, model noise, for example, inject dropout in the model. So you make like the predictions for, uh, like the teacher made predictions in the real images. But now when you're training the student, you're changing your alternate images. So input noise, plus you're injecting dropout. So you're injecting model noise. So they show that noise is very important to get the best result. And that's why also the paper is kind of called the noisy student because the student is trained like with a lot of noise. It's interesting to show that uh, they really improve the results a lot. For example, if you see like they reached uh, state of the art back then, despite that all these 300 million images, they were not labeled at all. 
and compared to other methods, for example, the previous state of the art that was before them, they were using a network that is like twice as big and they, I believe, had already some uh, weakly labeled images in JFT, while in this work here they are using for the same data set but no, no uh, labels at all, just like using the network to make prediction for pseudo labels. And then there were also other methods that were probably even bigger, like uh, twice as big as this. And they were using like even more images. For example, these methods here, they were using 3.5 billion images that had labels like based on the tags. And they were working like still worse than uh, what this noisy student is here. And then here they show, for example, you get like a family of networks that were state of the art, like efficient net, which have like, uh, I believe, six or se seven versions actually, or maybe eight, like from efficient net zero to efficient net B7. And then they use the same network, but this time with noisy students. So like when you're using it in a semi-supervised manner by adding the JFT data set, and you can see that every network improves a lot from the baseline, from the network that has been trained only in ImageNet. So they probably start like by improving one point, but even if you use the best uh, efficient net, efficient net uh, B7, like if you add like the unlabeled data set and then you use noisy student to make pseudo labels there and to use those pseudo labels during the training, the performance improves for around 2% here, two percentage points. So this is just showing how powerful this noisy student could actually be. And then they did like an ablation study when they showed that actually it, like this noise is very important. So you could train like maybe without noise at all here, but if you add like noise, for example, data augmentations, it improves a bit more. Or if you add dropout, then it improves even more. For example, let's say like we have this network here, like uh, it reached 84%, but if we add a uh, uh, so if you just train like in a semi-supervised manner, it reaches this result, 84.6. But if you also add the noise and all of this, then you reach like 85.1. And then they showed another very important ablation. Is that, as I mentioned, you could do this into like several times. So you get like the teacher to make predictions and then you train a student. And then they saw, for example, if they did this, they reached this number, like 86.7. But then if you promote the student to teacher and then you train a new student, then the performance improves like to 88.1%. And then like this uh, second student gets promoted again to teacher and then it trains a new student, the performance improves again. So they do like three times of training. So first you train a, a teacher, then you train a student who becomes teacher, then you train another student based on the predictions of the new teacher, and then you promote it to a teacher to train the final student. So they did like this three times. And every time the performance improves a bit. They also show that it is important like during the training to give also some real, uh, some real uh, labels or so some label data from ImageNet. But for most part, when they are training the student, they are using like mostly unlabeled data. So in the first, two networks they are training like the, the mini batch has like for every labeled images has a uh, 14 unlabeled like pseudo labeled images and then in the last step they have like for every labeled images they have like 28 uh, pseudo labeled images now i'm going just to summarize this like what are the findings that this paper show First one is that they show that it's very important to use large models for both the teacher and the student. While before in these teacher-student models, the idea was to just have like a large uh, teacher and then you try to learn a small student that uh, tries to emulate the teacher. So there the idea was a bit different. It was like to can we somehow uh, distill the knowledge from the teacher, like a big neural network to the student, a small neural network. In this paper, that they are going for maximum performance. They show that it's actually important for the student to be as at least as big as the teacher. So the student now, it's not anymore like a small network, but it's like a very large network. And then the second uh, finding that they found is that it's very important to use a lot of unlabeled data. Sure, Google can do that because they have like a lot of unlabeled data, like JFT data set, which is actually private. So people outside of Google cannot use it. 
but they show that it's actually important. So if you can use a lot of unlabeled data, do so. And then they uh, did different experiments with like soft pseudo labels or hard pseudo labels, and they show that soft pseudo labels in practice seem to work better than hard pseudo labels. And by soft pseudo labels, what I mean is that you don't like uh, make one hot labeling. When you do a pseudo labels, for example, if the network is saying that this is, I don't know, 92% of class dog, like in a hard pseudo label, you would make like dog one and all other classes you would make zero. And then you would say that this is an one hot labeling or hard labeling. Here they use the entire distribution as a label. So it doesn't matter like it doesn't matter like that uh, for example dog is like 0.92% and it is above some confidence threshold here it doesn't matter to make it like one and the other zero but you keep everything as it is. And that's what it is like soft why it's called so soft pseudo labeling because you are keeping all the labels that the network gives to you and then they show that it's actually important to have data balancing so to use also labels that are like 100 percent sure to be correct like from ImageNet, not only inferred labels like pseudo labels and uh, they show that it's actually good to do training at the same time of both labeled and unlabeled data rather than doing this first on the labeled data and then to first on the unlabeled data and then to fine tune on the labeled data like the results that you show were done like when the student is trained into both labeled and unlabeled data at the same time and finally they show that it's important to have like a large ratio between unlabeled data and the labeled data in a mini batch so as we showed like here they were using like uh, either 14 to 1 or 28 to 1 ratio and by just doing this idea that it's very simple, it's very similar to the original pseudo labeling. The main difference is that now you're injecting like this noise and uh, you're using uh, soft pseudo labels instead of hard one. They show that you could use this to reach state of the art results in ImageNet. So this is not like small data set. It's like ImageNet where most people try to reach the best results as possible, there were competition on it. And then they show that you don't need a new model, you don't need to make like a new type of ResNet or something. You just use what is there, add more data, infer pseudo labels for them, and then train onto both uh, real and, to, and the pseudo labels, real labels and pseudo labels. Now, so I might say, sure, okay, this work in classification, does it work into other domains? And there is like this very recent paper from CBPR this year that they used a similar idea to do metric learning. So you have like you're doing metric learning, for example, in this case, you have a data set of birds like CAP 200 2011. And then some of them are like labeled, but most of them are not labeled. So they are like unlabeled data. And then you train the teacher into the label data and then they use like ranking loss which is like uh, a paper from 2019 which comes like with a new loss for metric learning and then you so you train like this teacher then you you feed like the unlabeled data to the teacher and you get features for these uh, images because here in metric learning so you're not trying to know to what class it belongs but you're trying to get like good features so that uh, images that are from the same class have features that are similar to each other. So you feed like these features to uh, like some model that does clustering. For example, you might do k-means here. And then you have like different clusters. Then you just uh, like label these clusters. For example, you do colorization. For example, they say that this is cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. And then you train a student. So how do you train a student? You give like both the label data and the unlabeled data. And unlabeled data here is just like the pseudo labels that I mentioned. So just like some colorization of your data, like one, two, three or something. And then you train this with some loss, for example, ranking loss. Or maybe you could, in this case, they use like different type of losses. So you have like cross entropy for the label for uh, these data in addition to like ranking loss here but what is important is that if you check like 
it looks very very similar to what we did before the main difference is that now we change the domain from classification to similarity learning but the idea is roughly the same idea so the network might change the losses might change but the idea stays the same and I want to show like that pros of this network is that the rich state of the art results better than methods that do not use any unlabeled data. So by just using the pseudo labeling idea, they were able to reach state of the art results without needing to change the losses or like training strategy or anything like that. And it's showing that the pseudo labeling can be used in other fields. So it's not that pseudo labeling works only for classification, but it can be used on other fields. Albeit, this is like a very similar field to classification because metric learning and classification are related to each other. Of course, I showed that maybe there are some pron some cons of this uh, of these methods. First of all, it's that it's very very similar to noisy student, so it doesn't have much novelty, but it's still pretty nice that they show that it works into other domains. And maybe it is a bit convoluted. So first, you train a network into some loss, like ranking loss. Then you use that network to make features and then like using those features you do some clustering to get the pseudo labels and then you train again this. While probably it could have been, been done jointly a bit better with uh, classification based loss function for example normalized softmax or proxy NCA or group loss or all these other papers that could give you directly then the pseudo label instead of giving you just features which you then need to do some clustering on top of that. Again, it's not a big criticism, but I think it could have been done probably a bit neater than it is already. But the nice part is that it was still done pretty nicely, it reaches very good results and it is very simple. So that was for uh, pseudo lane idea. Now we're going to do to the third family of uh, semi-supervised learning approaches and probably my favorite one, the consistency-based semi-supervised learning. Now, so consistency-based semi-supervised learning has a very simple idea. Like you have an image, for example, this car here, or no, actually cars are like, th this is like labeled image, sorry. So you have like the labeled images, for example, car and bike, and then you have like some unlabeled images here, for example, scooter. Now for the labeled images, you just do what you did always, like you do some augmentation, and then you train it with, uh, with cross entropy loss. For the unlabeled images, you do some augmentations. For example, if you see here, like the original image, and then we did some augmentation, and also for the other images, for example, in this case, we did just horizontal flipping. And then you make the network minimize the differences on predictions between these uh, images. For example, as I said before, you could either minimize the KL divergence between these two images, between the softmax distribution of these two images, or maybe the L2 loss between the features of these two images. And that's it more or less. So like there were many methods that were doing this, but now we're going to just show a few of them. But the idea on all of them is uh, like a modification of what I said, like for the labeled images, you train them like normally, you train the network with them normally. For the unlabeled images, you make like some augmentation and then you make, you define as loss function, like a function to minimize the distance between the original and the, and the augmented version, be it uh, like AL divergent or L2 distance. So let's start with a paper, another paper from Google, like Mixmatch, a holistic approach to semi-supervised learning. So here they go a bit more extreme than this. They get like an image and then they do K augmentations on it. So they do several augmentations on this image. So we're talking for the unlabeled images after the network has already been trained a bit in the labeled images. Then they get the network to make predictions in each and every one of these augmentations. So as you see here, we have like here one, one uh, augmented image, we feed to the network and it's going to give us some, uh, some distribution. Then we do this for all the K augment images here. We get all these distributions here and then we do the average of them. And then finally we sharpen the image. So instead of just using softmax like we do, we use softmax with temperature. So in other words, you could just divide every 
every entry before SOCMED with some value t. So this is called like sharpening, but it's also called uh, softmax with temperature. But this is just a tiny detail that you don't even need to know that much. But the entire idea is that instead of just giving like one uh, augmentation, you give like several augmentations and then you get into some distribution, which is probably a bit better because you're not basing it in only one augmentation, but you're basing it into k augmentation. And then, so this is actually what I was saying. So you have like, then you just uh, guess the label of this image. So because you did like this, uh, you have like now the distribution, then you just guess the label of this image. And by that, we mean we just check the entry on the softmax with the highest value. And here is just the temperature softmax that I mentioned. So how this is done, like more, like let's go a bit like into the entire algorithm. So you have like this mixed mass procedure, you have labeled and unlabeled images, and then you have like these other hyperparameters, for example, temperature here. Here we have like just the cross entropy loss between the, between the, uh, for the labeled images and for the unlabeled images, Q is the unlabeled image, and this value here, like p model of y, depends on u and the hyperparameter and the and the theta, the weights of the neural network. This is just the distribution that uh, we got here. So this value of here, which is uh, done by assembling, like by averaging, like uh, distribution of uh, k augmentations from this real image. So now we have like this image here, which is going, which is, it gives you a distribution, for example, k, q, and then it also have like uh, this distribution here. And then they just do like the L2 loss between these two distributions here. And this is the unlabeled loss. So again, Jay, just to repeat, real like the real unlabeled image and here the value that we got for this image when we did several augmentation of it fed to the network and then uh, average them so this is the unlabeled part and then as final loss they just add the labeled loss with the unlabeled loss and some hyperparameter to scale it very simple and it works very well in practice now the same group of authors improve this paper to fix match and they improved actually significantly the results here. But let's see like how is the idea of this paper. So again, we have like, as always, we have like the label data. And for them, we ju you just do like some weak augmentation, and then you train a model like to do here cross entropy. For the unlabeled data, they change now things a bit. Now, instead of doing K augmentation, and then getting the prediction for each of them, and then finally averaging it, they actually do now just two augmentations, but they are different from each other. Like one augmentation is strong augmentation, which changes image very much. So it's like, uh, I didn't, I couldn't show like here in the figure, but they make like massive augmentation to this image, like completely changing color, doing massive scaling or translation or rotation. And one weak augmentation, which for most part is either translation or rotation. And then they fit this uh, image, like weakly augmented image, to the model. And this model is going to give you a prediction for this image. For example, it's going to say scooter here. And then you use uh, this uh, prediction as a pseudo label for the strongly augmented image. And then you do the final loss. So the final loss here is like for the labeled part, as always, cross entropy on the images with their labels. For the unlabeled part, they do like these two augmentations when the weak augmentation image is fed to the network to give you a pseudo label, which then you use for the uh, strongly augmented version. So here, the nice thing is that you're actually, in the end, you're using the same law. So you could just use cross entropy for both the labeled and the pseudo labeled images. But the way how you get the pseudo label is very different from before. So now you're not getting like a pseudo label on the real image or anything like that. But the uh, prediction for the weakly augmented image serves as pseudo label for the strongly augmented image. So in some ways, fixed match is combining the mixed match with the pseudo labeling idea. And by doing so, it's actually improving significantly and getting even better results. So I wanted to show that uh, like this uh, strong 
augmentation. They are like specialized augmentation that make the image look heavily different to how it was before. And for this paper, they use this randaug library, which I believe it was also done from the same group, or at least it was done from Google in the same year. And if you check like these images, I, like they, they make like really massive differences to the original image. For example, here we have like the original image and now we see like how it changed a bit the color. It also removes some of the pixel here, like in this part here. Then you could, it does auto, auto contrast here. Like you could even make it more different, like change the colors even more while keeping the, like the removed uh, pixels. And then depending on the magnitude, you could go like even more extreme. Look here, like the images have been also now, it's almost like it has been uh, translated, like, and uh, it has, we have removed even more pixels here. And then you could do like both a translation and the rotation and remove even more pixels. So as you see now, this image here looks actually quite different to the original image here. So that is what they use in this paper for strong augmentation, but also in noisy student. And then here are like some ex other examples, I believe from from Cypher. Um, yeah, I believe from Cypher 100 when like even for a human, it's very hard to actually see, for example, what is this object here. So they use like massive augmentation. They show that this is actually one of the keys for this method. So like now we can check like the results and we had like a uh, mixed match before, for example, if you train in Cypher 10, which has 50,000 images, but you label only 40 images. So you have, because Cypher 10 has like 10 classes, 10 stands for classes. So you're having only four labels for every class. Using mixed match, you could reach like 47% or so. 47% error rate. So you're roughly like 52, 53% accurate if you do this. And of course, if you train only in 40 images, you're going to reach only 10% accuracy because uh, their network is, is going to be like overfit so much that it's just going to do essentially random guessing because it won't be able to learn anything useful. But if you use mixed match, you're still able to do pretty decent results here, like roughly one in two images, you're correct. But if you use fixed match, like this new method that I just explained, you are correct at around 89%. So you have an error rate of only 11 images, which is pretty crazy when you consider that most of your data set is unlabeled. So you have only four labels per class. And then they show that, for example, if you use 250 labels here, like uh, 25 labels per class, the error rate drops on only in 5%. And if you use uh, 4,000 labels, so like this is a bit less like than 10%, so it's roughly 8% of the, your data set is labeled. They have only another rate of only 4%, which is more or less similar to what if you had used the entire training set. And this is very important to emphasize. Like with only 8% of the data labeled, they are reaching the same results as if you have an entire is if you have the entire data set labeled. So this is pretty good, I would say, because you don't have, if you're using this method, then you don't have to use to label the entire data set, but you could label only a small part of it. In this case, it's 8%. Of course, this is only in Cypher 10, which is like a very simple data set. So if you go in Cypher 100, also there, uh, like the error rate is now 22, so they are accurate uh, around 78% if they're using like 10,000 labels, so one fifth of the data set is labeled. While if you would have used the entire data set, the result would have been, I believe, over 90%. So it's not that in every data set you could just get away with labeling 5%, but at least in this simpler data set, they are showing that you don't need to label all of it. You could just label like 5 or 10% of it, and you're going to get pretty good results. And then uh, in a more complicated data set, you are still going to reach pretty good results compared to what you would have reached with previous methods or with a fully supervised baseline. Sorry, with a fully supervised, what by that I mean, for example, if you had like, if you just trained into these 10,000 images instead of training like they did in 10,000 images with labels and 40,000 images without labels. So 
it looks at at least for classification, like uh, I wouldn't say that the problem is solved with fixed match, but it's getting close to doing as well as you can do with a uh, with a fully with with a uh, like a fully supervised baseline when you use the entire data set like you label the entire data set and then you use all of it. Now, one question might someone might say, okay, cool, it works for classification, but classification is a relatively simple problem. There are more problems in computer vision than classification. And you cannot, I mean, sure, you, can, you have a very good method for classification, but can you use it for other stuff? And yes, like uh, the idea of consistency has been shown that it can be used for other problems. And I'm going to explain here like that one of those problems being detection. And this is actually a paper uh, from NeurIPS 2019, which is similar to mix match, but it is done for object detection. So what do they do? So here, like the, the schematic is both for single stage and for two stage detector. So single stage, for example, SSD detector or two stage detector could be, for example, faster or CNN. But it is the same idea into both of them. So let's just go for a single stage detector. You have an image, for example, this image here, and then you augment it by doing a horizontal flipping, as you can see here. So it's the same image, it has just been flipped. Then you feed it to a neural network. To, in this case, they feed it to a SSD single stage detector. And then your network is going to make prediction for these two images. So it's going to predict the bounding box and it's also going to predict the class for this object. So it's going to find, for example, for this pedestrian here, it's going to find varieties in the image and also that uh, to what class this object belongs. And the same is going to do for this other pedestrian here. And then you just use between these two predictions, you use some consistency loss like L2 distance between the features or KL divergence between the softmax prediction. So you use like some consistency loss to try to, and then you minimize it. Of course, because we are in semi-supervised learning, you also have some labels for some images. And for those, you just have like a, you just use the supervised loss as normal. So you feed to the network some images that have uh, labels, some images that don't have labels. For those that have labels, you use, uh, for example, SSD you would use the multi-box loss. And for like those that don't have labels, you use some consistency loss. The same thing is done also for uh, two-stage detectors. Just the difference is that now it's done into two levels, like in region proposal network, and also in classifier, like in the last part when it does the classification. And in case of you don't know what I'm talking about, I would recommend to take the CV3 course on segmentation tracking and detection when we uh, when we explain in details like these networks. But the idea here is that in two-stage detectors, you first try to predict where is some object, and then you get that part of the image and then you try there to predict uh, the exact position of it and also to what class it belongs. So they do more or less like the same thing as we did into one stage detector, they do into two stage detector, but here you have like, you could add like consistency loss, like either in classifier or in RPN, and in this case, they are doing it into classifier. Now, as I said, like it for the labeled part, it's not, uh, interesting to show what laws they use because they use the same loss as the network here like single stage detector they use multi-box loss but how is the loss for the unlabeled part and what they do they try to use like two different losses one for the class prediction for example it would say that there is a pedestrian or there is a horse and one loss for the opt for the bounding box because like a uh, network might say that, yeah, there is a pedestrian here, but if it's put in the, the box completely wrongly, then that's not a good signal. So you're trying to also be able to know the position where the object is located. So let's see how they do. For the class predictions, pretty easy. You have the class prediction of the original image, like, as we show here, like CI prime, and then you have that for the uh, augmented version for the shifted, for the, the like shifted version, like horizontally flipped version, like would be called like CI hat. 
And then you just do the KL divergence between these two distributions. So you're taking the softmax distribution of the original and the augmented version and doing KL divergence there. Now, because KL divergent, it's not symmetric. Like uh, changing the order of these two images. So if you put like CI prime, CI hat, it's different to putting CI hat, CI prime. So what do they do? They actually compute it for both of them. So you first do like KL divergent of uh, original image with the augmented version, and then you sum the KL diversion between the augmented version and the original image, and then you just scale it by two. So you just do the average of this, and this is like the consistency loss for the prediction, for the class prediction. Now for the bounding box prediction, they do more or less similar, but here like bounding box is going to give like you, it's going to be defined only by four numbers, the displacement of the center, like, x0 and y0 and the width and the height of the bounding box so what they do they do here you see like for the width like they just take for example the value of the real image and then you remove from that the value of the of the augmented version of the image so you're just doing like uh, the norm of these two values for example if the network is doing a very good prediction so it predicts that the original in object has like uh, it's like seven centimeters and also the augment it's like seven centimeters wide and also the augmented version is seven centimeters wide then here it means that the network is already perfect in this prediction and this loss is going to be zero and the same it's going to be like for the uh, height of the image and for the di displacement of the like the second coordinate of the center. So you're just going to remove. For the first one, of course, you have to add the displacement of uh, x0 because you're doing this uh, rotation. Sorry, because you're doing this uh, flipping here. Okay, let me remove this. So because you're doing this flipping, so now the coordinates have changed. And so you have like to add like a minus here. But the idea is more or less the same. You're just doing the L2 distance between the coordinates, between these four coordinates. And then finally, you for the consistency loss here, you just uh, have like a mini batch of images and then you just add like, uh, like the consistency for the class and the consistency for the localization for the bounding box. You just get these values and then like the average of this is like your loss for the for the semi supervision loss for like for the images that don't have labels and the final loss is the loss of the labeled images like the class prediction for the labeled images actually sorry this is for the unlabeled images so just this loss here is the final loss and then you just add like the L1 for the labeled images and the and the classification for the labeled images so no magic here very, very similar to classification. You're using the same idea of, for the real image, for the labeled images, you make predictions for them and you have like labels so you can measure how good are the predictions and then you can penalize them if they are wrong. So you use like multi-box loss. For the unlabeled, they came up with this consistency loss, which has two parts, one for the class predictions and is based on kullback leibler divergence and one for the bounding box predictions, which is based onto this uh, L2 loss, as I described here. And by doing so, they show that you could actually improve, like significantly, you could add like two, three points into detection, like in, for example, Pascal VOC data set, which is like one of the most common used data set for detection. Maybe you have like only one third of the images labeled, and then you, if you train like in only one this in only these labeled images, for example, you're going to get 70%. But if you add the unlabeled images and then you train with this extra loss, you get 72% or so. So you're kind of adding 2% like by just using unlabeled images. I would really recommend you to check this paper because it's a very nicely written and simple paper that shows how a simple idea can be scaled from classification to detection and reach very good results. Now, because this was like two years ago, people have improved over that. And there is this recent paper, Humble Teachers Teach Better Students for SSL Object Detection from CBPR 2021. And I made like a relation that 
if this previous paper is kind of getting mix match and doing that for object detection, this paper, this new paper, is getting fix match and doing it for object detection. And if you check the schematic here, you could see how similar this is to fix match. Of course, it has other novelties here, it has other differences, but it's still kind of similar to fix match. So again, you have like, uh, for example, a mini batch that has some labeled images and some unlabeled images. For example, in this case, the dog is a labeled image and the cat is an unlabeled image. For the dog, like the labeled image, you do a strongly augmented, strong augmentation. So you strongly augment it and then you feed to this network, which they called a student model. And student model is just going to do like a supervised loss because it's just a, it's just going to predict the loss. For example, if, if you would have used SSD, the multi-box loss on this image. Now, what you do for the unlabeled image? Like in mix match, you do two augmentations. So you do this a strongly augmentation here, and then you do here, like in this part, you have like the original image and the flipped version of it. So now this image has been tra transformed to three images. Strongly augmented image, weakly augmented image by using flipping, and the original image. Now you feed like the these two images here, like, uh, and then it's going to give you like uh, some predictions for these images, for this image here. And then you use this prediction as a pseudo label for the image here, like for the strongly augmented image here. So as you did in fixed match, when you use like the weak version of the image, the weakly augmented version of the image to give a pseudo label for the strongly augmented version of the image, you're doing the same here. So you're using like these, uh, like ensemble of images of the original and the flipped image to give you like some, uh, some uh, softmax distribution, like some prediction for this that you average from these two images. And then you're using this uh, softmax distribution, like soft label as pseudo label for the strongly augmented version of the image. And then you just do this, what they call the unsupervised loss, but in this case, it's unsupervised because you don't really have a label, but what you have is a pseudo label. The pseudo label that you get from the teacher serves as a label for the student. And then like to get the final loss of the student, you just add the unsupervised loss and the supervised loss. You get the final loss and then you backpropagate it over the student to make your student train like to become better so the student learns in this way from both the real from both the real labels and from the pseudo labels so the student is using both the the real labels and the pseudo labels so both the label data and the unlabeled data to make uh, to learn now how do you update the teacher so they show that actually in a different way so they are not doing back propagation at all over the teacher because then uh, like you would get like more or less uh, like the teacher is going to give prediction, but then it's also going to get penalized in those predictions. This way it's going to get very detached to the student and the networks are not going to properly learn. But what they did is to use something called EMA update or M update or uh, like exponential moving average. And this is probably easiest to describe with an equation. You get the weights of the teacher and then you get the weights of the student. So you have like some hyperparameter alpha that you change, like you shift every weight of the teacher, you multiply with this hyperparameter alpha. And then every weight of the student is multiplied with a hyperparameter one minus alpha. Now in practice, you use some very large number like 0.995 or 0.999 for alpha, which means that the teacher like shifts their weights based on its previous weights plus tiny change in the weights based on the student weights. So what we're trying to do here is that the student is getting updates, it's getting like learning based on the prediction of the teacher, based on the pseudo labels of the teacher, while teacher is getting is learning, so it's changing the weights based on the weights of the student. So there is no backpropagation going on on the teacher, it just gets the weights of the student 
it multiplies them with a very small factor. For example, in this case, it will be 0 0.005. And then it adds that value to the previous weights that the teacher has. So we want to keep the weights of the teacher as they were before, but just tiny change in them in the direction of the student. So in this way, instead of only teacher uh, teaching the student, like as it is doing by adding pseudo labels to it, also the student is teaching this, the teacher by giving its own weights and then shifting the weights of the student of the teacher based on the weights of the student. So in this way, there is a kind of a chicken and egg scenario when both of them are kind of at the same time uh, learning from each other. Like the student is learning from the teacher by using the pseudo labels of the teacher, while teacher is learning by the student by doing this uh, Emma update here. So by using two, uh, students' weight to change the weights of the teacher. And they show that this is like, uh, it works very well in practice. So I believe here it's actually with retina net and you have like this uh, Pascal VOC data set, which has two data sets like VOC 07 and VOC 012. Like VOC 07 has around 5,000 images and VOC 12 has around 16,000 images. So if you only train on VOC 07, you get a score of around 60, 76.3. While if you train in both data sets, like a supervised model, would get a sco score of 82.17. So six points better, more or less. Now they show that if you actually do this, like using humble teacher, so, so using this method when you're uh, using both the labeled and the unlabeled data, you improve to around 81%. So you jumped almost five points from a model that has been trained only in VOC 07. In fact, by not using any label on VOC 12, you reach results that are only 1.2 points worse than if you use this entire label data set. And this is pretty good because this data set is three times larger than VOC 07. And by using this method, you sacrifice one point but at the same time, you're getting a significant improvement by not using, uh, by, by not needing to label this. So you could either label this entire data set that, that is three times as large as the label data set you have, or just sacrifice one point and use uh, this humble teacher, and then you get these results that are very, very nice. So these two papers that I explained, and there are, others like stack that I didn't explain, this uh, show that you could get like these ideas from classification, be it fixed match or mixed match. Maybe you change them a bit because, for example, you needed to define the loss for the localization loss or you're adding this EMA update. So you add like some stuff there, like you add some novelty there, but you could get the main ideas from the papers in classification on semi-supervised learning classification and apply those ideas on semi-supervised object detections and reach a result that are very good. Not only that they improve over a model trained only on the label data, but they, they would be almost as good as a, model, as a model that has been trained in all data in a labeled manner. Now, uh, we could probably go into findings here and uh, for the consistency-based methods, be them in classification or object detection. The key idea is to alter an image. So you make some augmentation in the image, and then you try to predict the same uh, label for both the original image and the augmented version of it. So you define your loss, something that tries to minimize the differences between the predictions of the real and the augmented image. So it could be KL divergent, it could be L2 loss, for example, for localization, or maybe L2 loss on uh, feature level. So like this is main idea of all consistency-based methods. And they changed a bit like from each other based on how they do this, but the idea is the same. Image, augmented image of it, try to make the same prediction for them. And as I said, like the network, uses as self-supervised loss, either KL, KL divergence, if you're, or Jensen Shannon, for example, if you're using like softmax distribution of the network, or maybe L2 if you're using features or uh, bounding box coordinates. 
for example, on, uh, on the object detection paper, like they use L2 distance between the predicted coordinates of the bounding box and the, and the augmented version of it. And with this uh, simple idea, you could reach like really good result, be it in classification or object detection. And actually, people have done similar stuff also in segmentation, like in consistency base, when maybe you get like some image from with, with some sur surrounding, and then you make another cut of the image with some other surrounding, and then you try to make the same prediction for the pixels on the on the two images. And as I said, all these ideas kind of are just scaling the ideas from classification to object detection. And as we showed, like this consistency based uh, semi supervised learning and pseudo labeling semi supervised learning are related to each other. And even better, they can be combined with each other as they were done in fixed match and humble teacher to get the best possible results. And now, like as we show, like in both domains, the results are almost as good as if you had labels for everything, despite that you have labels for only a small part of the data set. So very nice works from all these people to reduce the need to label the entire data set, but to allow people to have like a large data sets, but labeling only small part of it, and then being able to reach very good results. Now, one question might be, what about the labeled part? Because we didn't explain much about the labeled part. We just assumed that someone has given to us. So, but that's not really the case for most real world application like you get like data and then you have to label some of it either by yourself or paying someone to do it and the idea is like the question is if you can label only a few images be it on supervised learning or semi-supervised learning how should you choose them how should you choose the images that you want to label how should you choose the most interesting images in the data set that if you label them, you maximize the performance of your network. And this is going to be the topic for the next lecture. So thank you very much and see you in next lecture when we are going to give a, like an, a lecture on active learning, which is the idea of how to choose the most informative images in the data set and then to use them to improve your network. Thank you and see you in the next lecture.